Welcome to Positive Disintegration Podcast. This is Episode 7, Gifted Minds and Empathy. Hi, listeners. Welcome back to the podcast. This is Positive Disintegration, a framework for becoming your authentic self. I'm your host, Emma Nicholson, from the Adults with Overexcitability YouTube channel and the Travis Gift blog. And with me is co-host and resident expert, Chris Wells, a Dabrowski scholar and researcher. Hi, Chris. How are you today? Hi, Emma. It's great to be back. Happy New Year. Yes. Happy New Year to you too. We've finally made it to 2022. And I'm kind of excited today because I'm not the only person from Sydney on the podcast this episode. I know. It's very exciting that we have two people from Sydney at this episode. I think that's cool. So our guest today is Fiona Smith. Now, Fiona is the Director and Principal Psychologist of Gifted Minds, which is based here in Sydney, Australia. She has been working with gifted children, adolescents and adults for over 20 years and truly believes she has the best job in the world, identifying, understanding and helping others understand, educate and parent these intense, sensitive and unique thinkers. Welcome to the podcast, Fiona. Very good to have you on. Thank you. It's really good to be here with both of you. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us, Fiona. No, I'm very excited to talk with you today. I'm fascinated to hear what you guys are going to ask me. It's going to be a bit of a journey, I think. No doubt. No doubt. Always is here. Exactly. Yes. Well, the first thing I've the first thing I want to know is how you first learned about Dabrowski's theory. Yeah, we have to go a long way back, but not quite as far back as 1938. Thank goodness. I'm not that old. So I'm feeling <laughs> feeling elderly compared to you two. So I guess the journey goes back to the birth of my oldest daughter, really, but that was before I knew about Dabrowski. Um, but she, from the time she was born, was a incredibly intense, sensitive child. Okay, so I was looking for answers from her birth. She's now 36. She was a tantrum-throwing, head-banging, super-sensitive infant. She banged her head on the ground in frustration at the age of nine months. So my husband's a psychologist and I'm a psychologist. At age four, we took her to a psychologist because we could not work out what was going on with her. So she was the beginning, really, of looking at intensity and sensitivity. So I've always been looking for why and how to manage this. I mean, I tried everything with temper tantrums. I tried sticking her feet in a bucket of cold water. I tried, I tried chanting mantras to her. I tried everything. All, all that would stop her tantrums was holding her and she would just fling her arms around and scream, I cannot help it, I cannot help it, I cannot help it. I, it's, it's all too much. And that is actually what it's all about, too, too much. It's all too much. So she was assessed at the age of four and found to be uh, extremely smart and that sort of gave us a bit of a a, um, window into why she was having the tantrums and that was to do with frustration. Literally, every time she was frustrated, she she threw a tantrum. So, okay, so that's the very beginning. So then we soldiered on and it took me five years to even think of having another child and then I had my son uh, who was chilled to the point of being horizontal. So I had this intense first child, this extremely chilled chilled second child. So then I thought I could start doing something I was very interested in, which was a master's degree, which was uh, majoring in gifted education, and it was through the University of New South Wales, the Jerick unit. So anyway, I um, got to listen to fantastic uh, teachers from all over the world because Mirika Gross, who was the professor there at Jerick, um, brought in speakers and helped us not just through the Masters of Gifted Education but also through something called COGE, which is a Certificate of Gifted Education, to learn more about how to educate gifted children. Now, my background was psychology, so I was coming through with a a psychology degree, not an education degree, so I wasn't so much interested in teaching. I wanted to know what was going on in the heads, especially the heads of my children, who are extremely weird. So I did the Masters. And through Mirika Gross and Catherine Hookman, I 
was introduced to the concept, probably first of all in those dark ages of overexcitability, because that's what they were cherry picking out of Dabrowski at that stage. So we're talking 92 through to 94. Um, and yeah, I just was instantly, as probably a lot of parents still are, attracted to this idea of, yes, that is my child. My child exhibits all of these things in different intensities, frequencies and durations. But yeah, the start was then. Yeah, so many people come to this because of their children that it really is amazing to me. And yeah. me too. That's how I came to it too, trying to figure out my own kid. And it's it was a huge relief to know that, yeah, this is, this is the experience that um, children have. But also I didn't see her as broken or anything wrong with her. I saw her as difficult. She was certainly difficult and intense, but I wasn't prepared to take her to a psychiatrist. I didn't think she had anything that um, indicated any problem. What I found from very early on was boredom and frustration increased all symptoms or reactions. And um, so I learned that this is a child that I had to sit, literally, we put her in a car seat, she screamed, she hated being restrained. Um, the only way to stop her screaming when we were travelling in a car was to play games like, we play games like what rhymes with this, what rhymes with that. What's, we used to play the game, the doctor's game. What's the doctor that treats feet? What's the doctor that treats bones? What's the, like she was two. So we had to keep her mind going all the time. Then there was the emotional intensity. I mean, when her brother was born when she was five, her immediate reaction was, can we take him back? You know, no, thank you. <laughs> He's boring. Oh, no, I don't want to have any, anything to do with him. So by the time I lived through her and then done the Masters, I was in a very um, privileged position, I think, of um, Jerick wanted to open up an assessment part to the um, centre. And I did not at that stage have registration as a psychologist, but Mirika and Catherine told me if I could get the registration, I could start on board with the assessment of gifted children at um, Jerick. And this was a dream, like literally, I would be working with children that I just found absolutely uh, mind-blowingly fascinating and had had experience with. So yeah, I got my registration through, I joined the Australian Psych Society and I started working at Jerick. And that's when I really, really expanded and learned a, a lot more about Dabrowski and also about the whole theory of positive disintegration and embraced it within my whole framework of work. So tell us about your work with gifted children, that we've had the lead up to it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it was a dream job. So it started, I started working with Jarek in 1998 and I adored the time identifying the kids now. I loved the time with the children but I did not like the assessment tools. So I was doing IQ tests, so <laughs> I started using the WISC-3, and I don't know how much you or our audience know about psychometric tests, but, you know, basically they are not designed to test gifted children. They are basically diagnostic tools and were used for looking at abnormal behaviours and things like that. So, yes, we can say a child has a high level of ability using an IQ test, but, again, they're not ideal. I'm still waiting for someone to design something that looks more broadly, not just IQ, but more broadly. But at the moment, we still don't have that apart from the Anne-Marie Roper um, type of assessment, which is an entirely different way of looking at a child and takes about 10 years <laughs> of learning. <laughs> Very, I would love to have done it, but A, we're in Sydney and B, you have to be in America and it takes years. So, yeah, I found that what happened with uh, doing the WISC-3 is that the first question that I asked the child was, and I'm pointing to my nose because you won't be able to see this, what is this? What is this? I'd ask a gifted child, what is their nose? And they would be flabbergasted. They would be patronised from the minute they started. Now, Assessing gifted children, it's all, and, and assessing any child, to be honest, is all about building respect and making the rapport strong enough that the child feels that they can trust you. It's very easy to underachieve on an IQ test. I mean, you can simply not give what you know. 
you can very rarely overachieve on an IQ test because you can't give what you don't know. But the child that doesn't feel trustful of the um, examiner is not going to give what they know. So I was very aware of this very soon. So I sw swapped from using the WISC to the Stanford Binet at this stage because you could test in on the Stanford Binet. You could do two routing tests um, and then go into the age level that they got, you know, albeit they had to do well on those two routing tests, but it meant that a six-year-old could enter the test at an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old's level, which made a huge difference. So remember, I'm coming from a background where I saw extreme boredom and frustration in my own children and what that did to working with children of all levels of ability, gifted and beyond. Now, that's the main thing. I was working at the gifted resource centre, so I saw gifted children. They were generally going to be gifted. I very rarely saw a child of average, even high average ability. So... I had to, within the protocol of the psychometric testing, I had to work with the child to get the best responses. And that's where my interest in empathy came on because it was all about empathising with the child and picking up every single nuance um, and increasing the pace when they were bored um, and decreasing the pace when they were absorbed and knowing what the difference was and not asking inane patronising questions that shut them down and using humour as well too because these kids responded to humour um, and treating them as a mature person, not, you know, someone who was there outside their will or their control because I, what I was finding, you guys, was that these kids have a lot of experience where things are outside their control they feel helpless and hopeless a lot, especially within the, within the school environment. So I wanted to provide a safe space where I accepted them as who they were. I didn't see them as broken. I didn't see them as anything but that person. And so, yeah, I think that's where the empathy came in. And also the fact that I began to be seen as a bit of a maverick. And this is where it became difficult because... Yeah, you have to stay within protocol, but you also have to know your client. And that's when I become very interested in Linda Silverman's work and what she was doing with her clientele. And that's where I got my wrist slapped at Jerick, basically because I was doing things that Linda suggested doing. And, of course, she was another psychologist working with the gifted population. I worked with that population at Jerick until 2004. So I was there from 1998 to 2004, and then I went entirely private and worked from home. Um, and I did find the main thing was the difference between bringing a child into a university environment where they had to come up in a lift and kind of suffered from white coat syndrome, even though I wasn't wearing a white coat, but working from home, which is child friendly, they weren't anxious. They were not having any problems with that sort of anxiety and the rapport was easier to build. So from 2004 through to now, I've worked in private practice and eventually in 2008, called this Gifted Minds and now, you know, we have been going since then. Well, thank you. That's so interesting to me. I hadn't put together that you worked with Mirica Gross. Uh, look, Mirica was a groundbreaker and um, I owe her so much in terms of my interests. Um, um, but we had some difficulties when we opened up the um, assessment clinic to include other psychologists um, especially psychologists with a clinical psychology background. The, and the centre actually shut down. I mean, Derek continued, but they stopped doing assessments about two years after I left. Um, they began using the clinical basis. They introduced using the child behaviour checklist. They were looking, there was a definite change from giftedness as, you know, part and parcel of who you are to pathology and I yeah I just could not deal with it I was called out for doing things that Linda did I had to um, give reasons as to why I didn't use the in the processing speed part of the WISC 3 I would substitute simple search for coding as Linda had suggested and I got called out on that and there was a lot of things that in the end it was just didn't make it worth it for me because I started to have this inherent um, <laughs> cardio cardiological reaction and I was getting um, 
SVTs. So basically, superventricular tachycardia responses. So my heart rate would go up to 220 beats a minute. And I would be uh, <laughs> kind of, well, that's very interesting. It's interesting I never panicked about it. It just seemed to be an interesting bodily sensation, but I couldn't control my reaction to it. And so part of the reason to come out and work privately was to sort of get a handle on what was going on inside my own body in terms of the reaction to that sort of stress. You know, an interesting thing about your story that I related to way before we ever even met was that problem. I have that same kind of physiological reaction and it's not so bad now for some reason, but when I was younger, I would end up in the emergency room because my heart rate would go over 200 beats a minute. And I would well, think, Chris, you know what it feels like. Then. <laughs> and so I, yeah, I mean, I, for quite a period of time when I was like between 18 and 21 or so, I mean, they were looking for something wrong with my heart because they, it, it just didn't make sense. And I just, it never occurred to me that it was anything but like a, a problem, you know, I, it, but now I look back and I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's overexcitability to me. Like, I mean, it, totally. It was, it was fascinating. I ended up in emergency one night where they actually, they actually um, said, look, your heart is really strong for it to be able to go at that speed, but we can't let it go because it was like two hours of this. And um, we're going to have to give you an injection where we stop your heart and restart your heart don't worry, we get the defibrillator out and we stand by just in case it doesn't work. But if you have a near-death experience, please tell us afterwards because we find them interesting. So I'm lying on the table and they, they do it. Unfortunately, I didn't have a near-death experience because I would have really been interested to see what that was like. Um, but then, you know, I was an adult working and I wanted to travel overseas and to go to conferences basically and talk at conferences. And I couldn't travel. I actually was stopped going to the Iowa Wallace Conference in 2004 because of this. The cardiologist said, you cannot travel because you might have one of these episodes in the States and, you know, you can't travel. So they wanted me to have an ablation. An ablation is a um, thing where they laser the circuits in the heart so it doesn't do that. So I went in and had an ablation. Lo and behold, I stopped having SVTs, but I have massive blood pressure reactions now instead so it was almost like my heart was going ha 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 you think you've stopped me no 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 so now instead of beating really fast it pounds really hard and I get blood pressure reactions that are like 190 on 120 and stuff like that so again the um, cardiologists are like yeah your, your heart is fine it's strong it's it's beautiful but that could affect your brain. You have to, we have to stop that. You, you know, you could have a stroke. So mm, that was part of the problem with my empathy was the reaction of my heart. And because I can't control it and I still can't control it. And um, I'd rather have the SBTs personally because they were few and far behind between, but the, the heart blood pressure stuff is, is ongoing, unfortunately. So I've stopped doing a lot of counselling because it was worth with counselling than it is with assessment, um, obviously. But there's a, I, I keep some clients on that I just can't, you know, leave. But, um, yeah, I pass the counselling over to the counsellor here at Gifted Minds basically because of that. Um, but it's a very interesting physiological reaction, which was why I wrote that paper for the um, Advanced Development Journal. It's, yeah, it's an interesting, I mean, to me, like, that's something I, it was on my radar in 2016, because we were at the Congress at the same time in Calgary. And I remember reading it and thinking, like, filing away for myself, okay, mm -hmm. here's somebody else who has this intense physiological reaction, although yours is, you know, much worse than mine was, or, you know, like, it's, that's quite a challenge that you've had to deal with. Yes, and no, it's also been an interesting um way of curtailing <laughs> some of the things that I want to do. I think maybe it saved my life in some ways because I can't, I've actually had to step back and I've actually had to take more control over myself. So I started doing a lot more yoga. I started looking at mindfulness. Now, the other thing that's uh, a personal, not difficulty, and again, I refuse to pathologise this because I don't see it as a disability in any way is, uh, and you know about this, Chris, it's that, 
I am what I proudly call an image-free thinker, okay, which other people call aphantasia. So I don't like the term aphantasia because of the A, because once again it means, you know, not, whereas I see myself as image-free. I simply don't make images. However, I do dream and I have incredibly vivid and lucid dreams at night. So it's not like my brain can't make images, it's just that I Look, I don't know. I don't understand it. But part of the reason also that I was very interested in the initial overexcitability stuff, um, especially the OE questionnaires that um, Frank um, designed, was that they talk about visualisation and not everybody visualises. So I had to have a look at those and think about it and um, understand that thinking is unique okay so thinking is very different for each person so I found it useful in myself to know that physiologically and you know cognitively I'm very different in a lot of ways but that's probably not unusual I think most people are different Um, neurodiversity is a fascinating you know thing that's become more and more talked about these days and that's part of it but also physiological diversity is also very interesting as well and the way we react and our intensity and our sensitivity, of course, come and brings me back to Dabrowski. So it just was perfect. It was a perfect fit. It's interesting you talk about physiological responses uh, because in Dabrowski's framework, you know, particularly when we look at um, uni-level disintegration, there's a lot of talk about those somatic responses. So do you sort of see part <laughs> of your journey particularly with your heart and the stresses you are under fitting into that part of the framework okay now here this is where you get me on Dabrowski light okay so I have read copiously um I know about dynamisms I know about multi-level and uni-level but I can't I don't know whether it's a blank out on myself I find it very difficult to fit my own experiences in within where I am and what I'm doing and also using that with clients. So I was, when I was counselling, I was very much focused on the fact that positive disintegration was a good thing, okay. It might not be fun, but, you know, it's certainly going to be painful, but it was something that we could actually get through. Um, And I was working with kids that, had the disintegration that didn't necessarily reintegrate at a higher level, would come back to the same level over and over again. Um, And I like that it's fluid and I like the flow as well. And I like the fact that, you know, we don't necessarily um, step up consistently. And also there's very few people um, who reach the highest levels, just like with Abraham Maslow's The Hierarchy of Needs. We don't get a lot of self-actualizers at the end. I like the process, okay, but when you ask me that specific question, I can't give you a clear answer because I don't know. And um, I guess this is why I said it's a journey. I'm still on that journey. And I think I keep cycling back and forth doing various things. And, of course, I retreated from the counselling because of the reaction. And I don't know that that's a good thing either. So, sorry, Emma, don't, I, the answer to that question is I don't know. <laughs> actually think that's not such a bad thing for people to hear that because not everybody wants to you know hear a bunch of people saying yes I've got my shit together because most people don't have their shit together so it makes more sense to hear other people say look I'm going through a continuous cycle and particularly as life develops and throws new challenges at you you're going to keep going through that because something new crops up and it's going to trigger something else yeah yeah and this is where I wanted to regroup about empathy because as I get older, and I'm, I am worried about this, my, my empathy levels, though they're still physiologically extremely intense, I find I have a lot less empathy for the human race itself. Like, and I know this is going to sound weird, but I think we're making such a mess of our planet that I'm kind of like thinking, yeah, I've had huge empathy. I was one of those children that picked Uh, bees out of the swimming pool so that they didn't drown, that won't hurt a spider, that believe that, you know, trees are living and are very interested in forests and bushlands um, and go 
my favorite place is in a tree, climbing a tree, feeling the tree around me. So I had this incredible empathy with nature, but my empathy with humanity seems to be decreasing. And I am worried about that. And I think it might have a lot to do with the consistent lockdowns and the pandemic. And I'm hoping that, you know, I will be able to feel that again. Having said that, I don't mean that I don't empathise with the children because I think the children are the ones that we have really screwed, basically. So, you know, we have a lot of adults out there um, floundering around, still doing the things they were doing years ago, still using plastic, still, you know, doing all the things that are just making this a whole lot worse for our children. And my empathy is with the children and with the planet. But I need to get my empathy back for adults, I'm afraid. So, yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. When you read that article, you know, I'm thinking, ooh, I'm not really that empathy goddess. I wish I was. Um, and I would like to get that back. It's understandable. We're being tested right now at the yeah. societal level, for sure. <laughs> to use a Dabrowski term, we're kind of like trashing the planet knowing it's not what we ought to be. Like we've got all this science and data telling us that we're making a mess of things and we're just choosing the lower choice continually, which is frustrating to witness. And it's like a temper tantrum. Like humanity as a whole is having a temper tantrum because we can't have everything we want all the time and do it the way we want to do it. And, you know, this idea that we have dominion over the earth, it just stuns me. Um, no, no other mammal has decided that they have dominion over the earth it's our home. We can't, you know, trash our home and expect to get away with it. We don't have another planet, you know, the, the trope, there's no planet B. It's true. I think that it would be great to hear more about how you use Dabrowski's theory as a framework, both personally and professionally, you know, how it has served you in your own development and how it has served you as a psychologist in your work. Okay. Okay. Well, Chris, Let's just dial back a bit because, um, as I said, I've been burned a couple of times and that has had repercussions. So the first time was within the GERIC framework and then the second time was when I was in private practice. So I was trying to work it out probably about four or five years ago now um, when there was that massive attack on the idea of the Brofsky's, um theory and the overexcitabilities and there were people literally saying no 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 you know that's all not right and um so what happened through the masters and my interest in the beginnings of understanding Dabrowski was that I did a number of projects for my masters using the overexcitabilities in different ways now because I was fumbling around in the dark, I had some fun using checklists and I actually sat in a <laughs> kindergarten once um, and tried to work out on che checklists that I was looking at duration, intensity and frequency as well as just, you know, ticking it off. So I was sitting there trying to work out how often it happened, how intense it was and how, you know, how frequent. And I couldn't because children are ephemeral and like goldfish and this is what it's like in the testing I can't take notes while I'm testing because the brains of the kids I work with work so fast that literally it's no there's no time if I'm going to wait and take notes then you know I've lost them again so I started with these projects and then I decided that I wanted to look at adult creatives um, now in your experience as you've gone around with this theory and you've you've grown up you guys you will have realized that people have baggage with the term gifted um, so <laughs> it's not it's not a term a lot of people like it's got you know but we could spend years just trying to define giftedness generally I go with the Columbus group definition of giftedness which is basically asynchronous development so I decided that the best way to hook into a gifted population of adults would be to um, look at authors because at least I'm going to get creative giftedness, even if it's not intellectual giftedness. But, you know, published authors um, are going to have a level of giftedness. So my daughter, the tantrum-throwing one, was going between the ages of about five and ten while I was doing this, and I started to look at 
children's books and became passionate about children's books because she could read voraciously and I wanted to stay a step ahead of, ahead of her. And so I read everything that she read. Um, and she was, you know, into all of them, uh, Lord of the Rings. She read the whole Lord of the Rings, the Dune series, all of these, like when, before she was 10. So um, I, I came across a project and I decided that I would contact a whole lot of Australian children's authors and ask them about whether or not, <laughs> first of all, they considered themselves to be gifted, what a gifted reader was. And I looked at it through the lens of, you know, their own writing. So I wrote them all, and this was in the days that we used our hand, I wrote them all letters and I've got all these glorious letters back from these children authors that were so interested um, in the idea. And I also sent them out a little tiny um, sort of overexcitability thing, but I didn't actually give them the whole lot. I gave them some questionnaires that kind of were a little bit different and I asked them about their own experience of overexcitabilities as a child and as an adult, oh, my God, the answers I got from these writers, because this was their, their area, were unbelievable. Okay, so literally going back over this just today, and this is, I haven't looked at it for a long, long time, the intensity and the sensitivity of these authors, and in terms of especially their emotional overexcitability, their imaginational overexcitability, and even the sensory overexcitabilities, was unbelievable. So I came at it through my own construction of how you would use this. So even before I was working with children, I was looking at how overexcitabilities and also the pathologizing of difference was occurring within different populations and why these celebrated authors wouldn't embrace the idea of being gifted. So, you know, again, Dabrowski, provided the lens with which to integrate all of this because you know these are these people who are very very different in the way they think feel understand the world um, but they're not broken yet so many of them would say I'm weird I really come from a different I'm odd or you know I I didn't have any friends as a kid or I was hyperactive as a kid or I did this and most of them would say I was bored I was bored um, and reading was my passion and things like that. So, yeah, I guess the way it interacts in my own life is not just through understanding gifted adults but, and gifted children, but also within the school. And um, unfortunately, I was finding that the kids that I was seeing, so going back to just IQ testing, that was only a part of it. Okay, so I, I decided really early, an IQ test is only a very small part. So I was giving them... Unfortunately, not the OE um, questionnaire that um, Frank designed, but just a very subjective checklist of different um, intensities and sensitivities that their kids might display. And I said to the parents, this was literally subjective. I didn't see it as a, it's not a, a specific or objective measure, but I wanted it as part of how their kids behaved outside the testing environment, within the school environment, within the community, because there was so much more involved than just an IQ score. So I was getting back lots and lots of information on how these kids were perceived by others, because remember, they're not filling it in. This was their parents filling it in about them, unless the child was 15 or over. And I also did some work with adults, so, so they'd fill in their own checklist as well too. And I asked them to um, check off various things, but I also asked them to elaborate. So I got lots of interesting elaboration on all of this that was going on within them. So, yeah, that became part of my report. So I had, I would go through the IQ test, and I'd also go through a profile of sensitivity and intensity. Okay, I didn't call it overexcitability. I wasn't allowed to call it overexcitability, um, but it was very much part of the whole nature of the child and that's when I got hit again basically um, I had a situation where I'd been doing this for years and years and years ever since I was at Jerick and I had a parent actually who I had assessed not only her children but also herself came at me with a clinical psychologist and basically sat me down came into my home and sat me down and said I was not allowed to do that anymore and could I remove that section from my report because there was no research basis for it and it was very, very damaging to people who, who had exceptionalities, okay? So 
she was letting me know that um, she thought I was damaging twice exceptional population. Now, okay, I had to have a big think about that. She also said that this had damaged her own children, the fact that I hadn't identified them as having twice exceptionalities way back, you know, 10 years ago. What happened was that I realised that I was never coming at it from that angle. I'm not a clinical psychologist, and I was very clear about that. I was very clear that I was not um, trained to look for that sort of um, exceptionality. So I didn't use the child behaviour checklist. I didn't use the ADHD checklist. I used nothing of that partially and mainly because none of that stuff has been normed on gifted children or gifted adults. So when the clinic clinicians came into Jerry, they started handing these out. Everybody, doesn't matter whether they were, you know, your average gifted child or twice exceptional or whatever, but they were coming in with huge scores on these checklists because these have never been normed on the gifted, the gifted population. So um, you have intense, sensitive parents who are checklisting on intense, sensitive children, you're going to get intense scores, okay, and they were. So I was very much um, aware of the fact that, yes, I do believe that there is ADHD. Yes, I do believe that there is autism. And, yes, I do believe gifted children are can be on these spectrums of various things. But I was also extremely aware of the potential to misdiagnose these kids or to overdiagnose these kids. So my within my practice, and if you look at my website, I'm very clear that I don't diagnose, that that is not my area of expertise. But if within an IQ test and within an overall look at intensity and sensitivity, I see something that puts my feelers up, I'll be, yes, this child needs further assessment. And when you do hit a gifted kid that really does have ADHD or autism, you know you, they are very, very different and they have, you know, twice, thrice multi-exceptionalities that will impact on their life. But a lot of the gifted kids that were showing high levels of frustration and a high levels of um, symptomology within um, either at home or at school were often the bored gifted kid. Overexcitabilities in lots of areas were firing because they were bored, really, really bored. Um, and that is what I'd seen in my own daughter. Okay, so if my main thing then was, yet yeah, okay, if you take your gifted kid and you expose them to sufficient challenge at school, then a lot of this symptomology, this reactiveness is not going to be as difficult. Um, you may not see it as much. The negative parts of it may disappear. The positive parts of it may become more intense. But the first thing that I was asking the parents to do was to get the child the challenge they needed. And one of the joys of IQ testing, guys, is the fact that the child doesn't know the level at which you're taking them, okay? So there's no fear. Then as long as I've done my job and the rapport is built, the trust is there, we have a good sense of humour. We just keep going up in levels until they are doing stuff that adults will do. So I could see these how far these kids could stretch, and they could stretch phenomenally, okay? There were kids who coming in at six that could do things that 12- and 14-year-olds could do. So I knew how bored they were at school. And I don't want to teach a bash, and I don't want to bash the education system, but these kids are doing the same stuff. They're doing it day in, day out at school, they're not getting challenged. And it's not the teachers, it's the curriculum. The curriculum is not designed for kids who are outliers. It's basically designed and it works really well for your low average to higher average ability kid, especially within a mixed ability classroom. But you've got your kid that's one or two or three standard deviations above the mean, it's not going to work for them. They are going to experience boredom and this boredom is going to come out and it comes out in all sorts of different ways. And it can be misinterpreted as ADHD, as autism, as oppositional defiance disorder, as all the different ABC labels that you've got, because any stimulation is better than nothing. And if you can't get stimulation, you're going to react in some way or another. So, yeah, I became very, very cautious in terms of being very clear about what and I was seeing and what that could mean and the fact that I'm not anti um, any labels. I'm just very um, concerned that they're correct. It's a real tough issue. This is something that I'm so interested in because it's not easy to tell the difference between what is a disorder and what is giftedness 
And the theory gives us an alternative mm-hmm. to the mainstream. And that's what's so appealing about it to so many people. And that's what your, that's your story is that the theory appealed to you because it wasn't pathologizing. You know, it was not a deficit perspective on these kids. But for me, when I came to this stuff, I was coming from the lens of pathology and I was very comfortable with it. And it was off-putting to me when I first discovered overexcitability because I thought, this is just euphemistic bullshit. I have ADHD and, you know, I did not take kindly to the idea that this was some alternative perspective. And so I've been just fascinated to see the changes in my own thinking and my own understanding of myself not thinking of myself from that deficit lens anymore and how it's opened up my horizons in so many ways to not box myself in to this idea that I have a disorder. And I've tried to, unfortunately, like, and also my story is that I came to this from pathologizing my kid. We went straight to medication and diagnosis with him instead of trying to really understand the underlying reasons why he was having such a hard time sitting still and producing in the classroom. And I wish I could go back in time and not start him on medication as a six-year-old and put him on that path. But, you know, we can't. Yeah. But, you know, Chris, teachers, and again, I'm not teacher bashing, bashing because I think teachers have a massive job being counsellors and you know, of all different things within the classroom. But it's the teachers that often propel the parents along that line because they don't know why the child is behaving in that certain way. And, you know, kids bouncing off walls in the classroom, it's going to be seen as a problem and it's not going to be like the teacher's not going to say, oh, he's bored because she doesn't know. No. Yeah. So, but, you know, the, the highly gifted kids that I've worked with, um, they're the ones that are their reactions will be either that intense so that they are really, you know, I had a, I had kids that lay under the table in the classroom and I had <laughs> kids that literally ran out of the room and I had kids that the class clown, you know, is a particularly uh, common one because they want humour, they want fun, they want high-level reasoning, they want to revoke things and, you know, there's a lot. Once you put that kid into an environment where that's happening every day anyway, a lot of those reactions go down. Um, So, you know, I totally get where you're coming from. And also what I see is that the kids that I was assessing in 1998 and 2000 are now parents. And if, if they have gone through the clinical psychology background and they have been diagnosed with ADHD or whatever, and ADHD is one of the few of the psychological disorders, okay, I'll, I'll go with that, even though I don't like the idea um, that we medicate, okay, is that those parents are bringing their children back already with diagnosis because they were diagnosed. So, yeah, I mean, I totally get that's what happens. Um, and it's a cycle and a circle that goes on and on. So when I say, you know, have you, has he, is he getting the challenge he needs at school, they don't even see it as part of the issue. They're like, but he should be able to see, he should be able to sit still in class. It's the real world. He has to be able to function in the real world. And I said, yeah, but he's bored. <laughs> I, can, I can see how far that child can stretch. And, you know, this is a child that can do algebra and he's doing letter recognition. He's going to be bored. He's going to react. It's a reasonable reaction to behave like that. And, you know, the parents are already brainwashed by that point. That to think, no, he needs to be able to survive. And look, you know, I'm not saying that we all should run wild in the, you know, <laughs> as adults or whatever, but I am saying at least within the classroom, surely we should be able to look at a child. You know, we are all about meeting the needs of children, but we refuse, especially if you've got a child who can stretch that far, because it's hard. It's hard to cater for those kids' needs. The teachers don't know what to do a lot of the time with these kids. What if you've got a six-year-old who can read like a 12-year-old? What do you do? You can't put them in year 12. That It's a difficult issue, but it doesn't mean, and I don't think it forgives what we're doing to these kids. I was unfortunately one of those children that got way too bored 
And I was the class clown stereotype, unfortunately, and also the chatter, the one that would get up and go and talk to everybody else because I had nothing to do and disrupt them and then get in trouble for disturbing everybody else. Yep. Um, and I totally get what you're, you're saying about you can't just, you know, pick a kid up and throw them into year 12. And I think the difference, though, between kids and adults is there's one curriculum in school. Like there's not one vocation out there for adults. We have a certain amount of choice over our stuff. So if you're dead bored with your job, you can go out and seek further training. You can look for advancement. You can try and do other things. Um, and you can do a whole host of stuff outside of work. And there's only so many extracurricular stuff available for kids and they're stuck with that one set of things that they've got to learn so it is a little different and I think when adults are then looking back at kids and saying oh well you've got to learn to adapt it's like if I was like that in my job I would quit look that's what I say Emma I say look what you don't get is try and think what it'd be like for you to me to sit you in a year six classroom not just once but for a whole week, so six hours a day, and expect you to do the year six work or maybe year three or maybe down further and not react because, you know, this is what your kid is doing every day. Now, schools don't like me. Um, they don't like that sort of thing being said. Um, so I've learned some hard lessons along the way. One is not to go into schools and uh, advocate for children because, and again, I, I do respect the schools and I do respect the teachers because they are fighting a battle that has been predetermined for them a lot of the time. Um, but, you know, when you get a school where the principal gets it or has gifted children of their own, or you get a situation where there's a gifted and talented coordinator who knows what to do, or even a teacher who's gifted or has gifted children of their own, that time the child gets that person it's going to be a year they remember um, I, I don't know about you if you think back to your schooling days you'll you'll remember the teachers that got you and they're the ones that you remember the class lesson you know there are teachers that I remember from way back when I was educated the main thing was their anecdotes not their lessons, but what they told me about the world. That's what was interesting. Uh, you know, the, the things they did on the weekend. But I mean, for the, for the children who are going through it day after day, this lockdown learning has either been an absolute joy or an absolute horror. Now, if it's been a joy, it's because the parents have let the children basically condense it into a tiny amount of work and then do whatever they like learning-wise during the day. So as long as they show that they have the outcomes, um, the ones that have had a horror in the gifted realm are the ones that have had to do the boring, everyday, same stuff at school where they actually had some release by whatever, you know, being a class clown or their friends because we go for our tribes and they'd made friends that were similar and they were stuck in a lockdown situation where it was painfully boring and this is where the parents were just losing it because there's a, you know, giftedness just doesn't pop out of nowhere. The parents are generally gifted as well too and they were reliving their own pain as well, not only their own their pain, their current pain of being in lockdown and pandemic and their fears, but also having to teach their children and watch their children go through the same things they did. So, you know, I, I'm not surprised that I've been feeling as negative as I have been feeling, but I'm never negative regarding the kids. I mean, I'm the biggest advocate. I just feel that there's a certain amount of banging your head against a brick wall that you can do. And with parents, it's just excruciating to have the child come home you know if they're at school or to be here and learning has become as my daughter used to say like walking through molasses well that's what it is and you know I remember from Michael uh, when he was over in Australia talking he was saying that these kids are quiveringly alive and that is what I experience these quiveringly alive children and so when they're doing the IQ test and they're going way way beyond level and I'm like wow that was amazing uh, they're just like blossoms they're like lotus flowers they just open up and the parents will say to me afterwards that was the best day they have had they were so excited in the car trouble is they have to go back to school tomorrow and sit in the year two classroom and do the stuff and you know it's devastating for them yeah, that's why I'm so passionate about it. It's the kids. 
and I uh, still seeing them, so it doesn't go away. I noticed in your empathy article, you talked about being able to achieve empathy through reading books and fiction, um, which is a passion area of mine. Do you think some of that ability for gifted kids to empathise with those characters and sort of get into those books um, is because they're seeing themselves in a way on the page um, and they're seeing characters that are described um, not only in terms of maybe being different or even po possibly being gifted, um, but it's described in a way that also engages them because I know Hermione in particular in the Potter series is one that a lot of kids will say, yes, I see myself on the page finally. As I was saying before, reading and books were a passion and I've become very interested in how much they gave gifted kids because of my own daughter's experience and now she is a published author so finally she got to do what she loves the most which is writing but yeah and I think the trouble for me is that these kids need access to much higher level writing much earlier okay so if you've got avid readers holding them back on and the reading um, books that they do at school with the very low level abstract content is going to cause huge problems okay so these are the kids that want free access to the library they want to read way above their age level they're they at six yeah they're Hermione they want to be they want to read about Hermione because they relate to her at age 11 okay they get where she's coming from also she gives them permission my favourite, Prisoner of Azkaban, where she can do multiple subjects because she's got a time turner. So imagine how much fun that would be as long as the subjects were interesting. But, of course, at Hogwarts the subjects are interesting because you're learning how to be a wizard. How cool would that be? But, yeah, look, I think, you know, Frodo and Sam and the Lord of the Rings, that, no, I used it in the article as a classic example of empathy, what they did in terms of Gollum the fact that they spared his life, that's the whole linchpin of the story because Gollum was the one that got rid of the ring in the end. Yeah, I'm a nerd, I know. So I, I remember all of this. But, you know, they're actually what I love so much is that they show, there's research to show that kids who do read, who do, they are empathising, they are learning empathy from the characters. So, yeah, even though as a non-visualiser, as an image-free thinker, I can't put myself into the characters and I don't have the experience of that sort of role play, um, the words and the descriptions of what they're doing are still so intense. It doesn't stop my reading. I'm an absolutely addicted reader. The only problem reading has for me is I can't, and this is interesting because I can't visualise it, but I can't read scenes of torture or cruelty to animals and I will not go to the movies or I won't watch TV shows or anything where there is torture or cruelty um, because that will trigger the physiological reactions and also it's just horrible and I don't want to see it. Um, so, yeah, I think another part of being um, image-free thinker is that for me cinemas, movies, going to the movies is absolutely unbelievable. I just love it because not having the images myself, I love to be surrounded by other people's images. And that's one of the actual reasons I worked out that I didn't have images is because I don't care how a person portrays characters from a book in a movie because I don't have an image of that child. So people who were outraged by the uh, characters chosen for, you know, Lord of the Rings or the Harry Potter series or various other Marvel comics or things like that because of their own perceptions of those characters. I don't have that. I just take on board whatever the character is that's thrown at me. But it's the words. And so going back to the books and reading the um, Harry Potter series again, is I love language. I adore words. I like how they feel in my mouth. And, you know, so in some sort of thing, it's maybe even a synesthesia type of thing, you know, a rewiring of... Um, how words feel. So, yeah, language is very important. Children will put themselves and feel like those characters. So, yeah, Hermione is a quintessential um, and also just drawing from television on The Simpsons. Lisa used to take that role as well too. That's right. Oh, my gosh. 
it's very relatable. Um, I want to ask you a question, but I can't, I don't, I'm not sure how to ask, but I want to ask you like about being image free and imaginational overexcitability. Because see, I am the opposite where I have like hyper imagery. And so for me, my imagine when I think of my imaginational overexcitability, it's very much this, you know, these images in my mind and what I've like, I mean, I had an imaginal world where I, but even though I had images, it was so much more about my feelings than it was even at times my imagery. But anyway, my point is, I want to ask you. Well, good. And like, also when you're answering it, think like maybe we could work together somehow to produce questions for, for a future overexcitability instrument that will reach somebody who doesn't well, we have need, we need to because you know there are more of us out there than they thought and um in all sorts of different fields but look i think the interesting thing about imaginational over excitabilities is that imagination doesn't just mean image making okay so imagination is i can think of it as creativity okay so I don't make images. That doesn't stop me writing. I write poetry. I write, uh, and I, as I said, language is extremely important to me. And also as a child, I didn't have an imaginary friend, but I built, in, I built worlds from, I actually used to collect, you know, the things they put in cereal boxes. So they, they put in um the Little Mermaid characters. So I would have the whole array of Little Mermaid characters and I would go down the bush because I lived in the bush and I would create worlds for these characters, literally, like I would get gum nut blossoms and I'd dress them and I'd put them in little places in under a tree and I'd set up little fairy kingdoms and things like that. So, yeah, I expect that's highly part of the imaginational overexcitability, but it was, it, <laughs> it was real, like I was doing it. So... Even though I don't see the images, I will script things, even if it's not as a child when I was doing it really realistically, I will also script. So if I want to, say, fantasise about something, I will have a script about it. So I will say I want to think about travelling. Instead of seeing a picture, I'll say, right, Paris. Well, yeah, OK, so I want to walk down the streets in Paris again. I want to see them. I want to go to Notre Dame. I want to see the river flowing in that incredible weird colour that it has. And then I will think about it in all different sensory ways and I'll be able to bring that back to me, but I will never see the picture. So there's no image there, but I can recreate that for myself in a language sort of way. Look, your hyper visual, your what they call hyper aphantasic, uh, Chris, and so is my son. So Dom works as the counsellor here at Gifted Mind. So he is hyper aphantasic and I am aphantasic entirely. And um, we have such an interesting bounce off about different children seen from different perspectives. Um, I <laughs> really embarrassed him once when he was 14 or 15 years old. All three of my children had imaginary friends, okay? So I thought it was normal. I didn't have them because I couldn't see them, uh, but I thought everybody did. So when he was about 14, his friends were hanging out here and I came bouncing down the stairs one day and I said, oh, hey, guys, you know, so I'm just really interested in my work. You know, can, you, can you tell me about your imaginary friends? <laughs> and Dom sort of looked at me and they went, what are you talking about? We had real friends didn't have an imaginary friends, Fiona. I don't know what you're talking about. So he's never failed to bring that up about the fact that not everybody has imaginary friends, Mum. You know, it's, it's only a few people. But his were really clear. He used to have mud people that lived in the walls. <laughs> he would see them and talk to them. And my youngest daughter had an imaginary dog. And uh, we'd go to the park and the dog would come with us and she accused my older daughter once of sitting on it and killing it and that was the end of the dog. So it was an interesting payback there. But, yeah, so I think, you know, the, the journey through Dabrowski has been fundamental to me because he's given me a way of seeing these children that I've both raised and um, worked with in such a multifaceted and positive way. Uh, I've just, it's been a joy really having the um, theory there because it's been the only theory, the positive disintegration 
that has worked for me. I've never found anything else that I can sort of hold on to in such a way. I mean, I've done a lot of work reading different therapists, Carl Rogers, Adler, all the different therapists, and I like a lot of things they say. But in terms of the theory of positive disintegration, I like the fact that, you know, it is okay to fall apart and we are going to fall apart, yet we can actually pull ourselves back together like Humpty Dumpty in some way or another. Whether or not it's better or not, I don't know, but we can keep on doing it. It's just not going to be one falling apart. There's going to be a number of them and maybe we'll get better at it. It's so true that it's not like it's just one time. It happens plenty of times over the lifespan. I, there's just one more thing that I just thought of while we were meeting that I wanted to, to bring up, Fiona, and that's I know that, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, roughly, we were supposed to have this conference here in Denver that Linda was going to have, this child-centered um, symposium. And so I know that you have been meeting with, like, Maggie and Michelle and Willem, or you were, and Ellen, you know, yeah. talking about gifts to adults. And yeah. so, you know... I would love it if you could just take a moment and talk about, you know, what you have talked about with them in terms of gifted adults and what, that this is what we're missing to my mind in the gifted world is that there's been such a focus on gifted children that those of us who are gifted adults kind of have been lost. Yeah. We don't have community. That's yeah. enough. Chris, I think the problem, a lot of the problem has been to do with the fact that it's gifted education. So we're only looking at children between the ages of, you know, schooling years. So gifted education is all about schooling, basically, and what we do with them in school. So, yeah, we have a huge missing chunk because it doesn't go away. It's not like measles. You don't get over it. You go on with it and then you have your own children and the process keeps on going and going and going. I think the joy for me, and I came in late to the group um, that you're talking about. So I don't feel particularly adept at telling you about what we've been talking about for a long period of time, but the essence of it has been Maggie's PhD and the way in which gifted adults see themselves and don't see themselves. And that is in tune with um, my work, which is <laughs> I went... I did a lot of talks with seeing. I started with matrilineal lines of giftedness and because that went down so well, I then did patrilineal lines of giftedness. And um, I just became fascinated with the fact that so many mums would say to me after getting a report and talking about it, oh, it comes from my husband, you know, it's, it's not me. I'd be like, uh, excuse me. <laughs> um, there's a lot of gifted women out there who have no understanding of their own innate giftedness and it's because of our concept of what success is and how we define success and it really ate at my soul, okay. I just, I said, look, think about it. Go back, think about your mother, your aunts, your great aunts, your grandmother. Think about the things that they did and I'm, I'm sure you're going to find in that lineage of mothers and females all the way back that these were people that, you know, were different in some way or another and that had, um, even though they weren't, you know, the president or they weren't a, a, uh, um, a doctor, these the, the women who were in teaching and nursing roles 100 years ago, those were the gifted women because that's all that was available to them. So I started getting into this idea of women embracing their own who they were. And so then I did one on the men and that was, you know, straightforward but I really was interested in the adults okay so how and how it was seen through grandparents I was looking at you know how the grandparents accepted their grandchildren as well too because often you skip the middle generation often the, some grandparents are really good at accepting some of the things of their own child of their own grandchild that they feel they had themselves whereas sometimes with the parent it's too close so sometimes I had parents who would be um, after we had our follow-up session, who would be so upset and worried and would open this huge can of worms because of their own childhood and what happened or didn't happen for them. But, you know, I, just having your child identified as gifted is just the very, very beginning because you then go backwards and then you go forwards and you look at who you are 
in a big way. And so, yeah, I, I felt responsible for not just saying, oh, your child has a number. I felt responsible for a whole um, avalanche of feelings and um, explorings that was then going to go ahead. But, yeah, with, with the group, we talk about basically Maggie's research um, and also about that sort of lack of owning who we are and accepting who we are, not just ourselves, but, you know, gifted women and gifted men in general and how everyone's had that journey to a certain degree. So, yeah, I think there is a huge opening for that. There's a lot of you know, adults who are still still deal, dealing with that and I think, you know, what you're doing, Emma, is fantastic because you need, they need somewhere to go. They need somewhere, someone to talk to with them and they need someone who understands where they're coming from. Thank you. I Right. I know that it means a lot to people to be able to listen to these episodes and feel seen and, you know, mirrored by what we're saying. But thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. It was good to be able to um, talk to people I knew I felt safe with. <laughs> there was no, no worry that you were going to come down hard on me. That's right. <laughs> thank you very much, Fiona, for, for being on the podcast with us. Thank you both for being there and doing what you're doing and getting Dabrowski out there because I want more people to understand that it's not a threat. It's not a threat to them. It's just part of more. Well said. I love that. Thank you. And on that note, thank you as well to our listeners for joining us on the podcast. It's been great to have you along with us. If you have any questions, feedback or topics that you'd like us to address, please get in contact with us. You can email us at positivedisintegration.pod at gmail.com or hit us up on Twitter or Instagram. Until next time, keep walking the path to your authentic self. 